The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. This is our sermon text for today. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is risen. risen Not bad. Must be 11 o'clock. All right, well, the basis for today's message is the gospel lesson from Luke chapter 4 that Pastor Sam read for us just a few moments ago. But before we get started, I have to give you a fair warning because I'm going to use a joke to help us with our object lesson for today. And since we know how poorly I tell jokes, this should go pretty well. A pastor boarded an airplane to take the first flight he had ever flown. And as they were about to take off, the flight attendant noticed his clerical collar, his panicked look, and his white knuckled grip on his seat. So she walked over to the pastor and said, Sir, I'm surprised at you. You're obviously a man of faith. You shouldn't be so nervous about flying. Don't you have any faith? Young lady, the pastor looked at her and said, Young lady, The promise of Scripture is, lo, I am with you always. It doesn't say anything about high. (laughs) Now, for those of you who didn't get that, let me read the punchline again. (laughs) Young lady, the promise of Scripture is, lo, I am with you always. It doesn't say anything about high. (laughs) There we go. Okay. Now, I can tell by your groans that that second presentation of the joke did help some of you. But if you didn't get the joke, please take heart, because I had to read that joke, come back to it 30 minutes later, and read it again in order to get it. So, if you didn't get it, well, I guess we're in good company, aren't we? All right. Now, some of you, though, got this joke right away. I heard your laughter. But if you only got it when I did the motions for low and high, then you receive the object lesson for today, which is that it is God who comes to us. It is God who reveals to us what He has done for us. It is God who brings to us understanding of all that Christ has done and what that means for our lives. Now, what is happening behind locked doors in today's text is way more than just realizing that Jesus has been raised from the grave. It is the understanding that Jesus is the fulfillment of all Old Testament Scripture and all that that means for humankind. This information is not attainable by the natural person. St. Paul tells us that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In this locked room and before Jesus' arrival, the disciples are in this state. Unbelief. 
They've heard the witness of the women. They've heard the testimony of the disciples that ran seven miles back from Emmaus to tell them that they have seen the risen Christ. They've heard the testimony from Peter and John of the empty tomb, and still they do not believe. In fact, Luke records they're discussing these things as Jesus appears. Now, I'm sure it's not surprising to anyone that they're startled when Jesus just appears before them in the midst of them. That seems quite normal, doesn't it? Since people just don't appear before us, they generally have to open up a door and walk through it in order to enter a room. But there's more here in the Greek. For that Greek word translated as frightened actually conveys that they are terrified. So Jesus asks them, he pauses their hearts, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? That question brings us back to Jesus' admonition towards them when they were worried about that storm in the boat while Jesus was asleep. They wake Jesus, he calms the storm, and then he asks them, why did you not believe? It would seem even the disciples, with all that they have seen and heard, have not come very far in their faith. So Jesus helps them recover from the shock of seeing and helps them to gain some understanding. He bids them to see his hands and his feet, to touch him and believe that they're actually seeing Jesus, after all, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. And as the cobwebs of disbelief begin to vanish and be pushed away, they are filled with a joy and they marvel at Christ's presence. But it's still too good to be true. So Jesus asks for food and he eats it in front of them, but they still need more to understand. So Jesus opens their minds to hear the Scriptures in a whole new way. That all of Scripture points to Jesus. Now if we place ourselves in the shoes of the disciples, it is pretty easy to understand their troubled hearts. But we stand some 2,000 years away from that event. So what about you today? What is troubling you? What doubts arise in your heart? Does your spouse doubt their love for you? Maybe there's a rent check overdue. Is it time to hear back about your acceptance to a university and you feel your future is in doubt? Maybe you or a loved one is facing an illness that seeks to separate you from those that you love. People of God recognize that Satan uses all of these things to speak lies into our life. Is your heart touched by family strife? Well, Satan wants you to think that family strife is the end of everything. But Jesus comes alongside and he reminds us that he is the one who binds up the hearts of the brokenhearted. He is the one who alone can heal every wounded heart. And where there is faith, hope abounds. Satan wants you to think that God will never provide enough for you. But Jesus comes alongside to remind us that he knows every hair on our head and every hair that used to be on our head. He promises that the Father knows our daily needs and he cares for them just as he fed Israel in the desert with manna and quail and brought water forth from a rock. 
Satan wants you to think that the rejection of a school will doom you to a life without meaning. But Jesus comes alongside to tell us that he is the one that gives our life meaning. And that you are a precious part of his body. He has a function for you to fulfill so that you might flourish in your work for his kingdom. Satan wants you to think that the death of a loved one is a forever loss. But Jesus comes alongside to proclaim, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Perhaps you are worried about many other things. And you feel that your future is uncertain. But Jesus comes alongside and tells us that by his word he has brought you faith. And now as a child of God and an heir of his kingdom, you have a sure and certain future that will never fade. You see, your troubled heart is proof that our fallen flesh continually experiences God's peace and it slips through our fingers. And when that happens, remember two things. The first is this. Satan is a liar. He wants you to believe that you are defined by your broken human nature. So remember the second thing. We preach Christ crucified and raised from the grave. As such, we already have peace with God. And even if the perfection to come is not yet reality, we are still defined by the sacrifice of and the redemptive blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary. It is He who has brought us through the waters of our baptism and buried us with Him. He has raised us to new life. A life that not only includes the faith to believe, but a heart and mind to understand. It is a purpose now given to you to share the gospel. Because the resurrection from the dead and life everlasting is coming. Now today Jesus comes alongside of us. He is present here with our worship because he promises he is with us always, even to the end of the age. In a few moments, Jesus will be present in this meal of bread and wine and we will take him into ourselves where he will join us with himself and with each other. He is the one who will bring forgiveness of our sins. He is the one who will strengthen our faith. He is the one who will increase our understanding. In today's lesson, Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the prophecies of the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. They all point to Him. Now, Luke doesn't specifically record what Jesus shares with the disciples, so it's going to help us today, I think, to maybe hear a little bit of the Old Testament Scripture. Some from Moses, the prophets, and of course the Psalms. First promise from God is that he would raise up another prophet greater than Moses, one that would mediate between God and man and insulate us from the fiery glory of God. So Moses responds to the people here. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. 
I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. To this, the Lord brings us to the Passover, where he reveals that a lamb slain and the blood poured out to cover God's people, to keep them from death, is realized when John the Baptist reveals that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is his blood that now covers all of us and keeps us from death. Remember that promise that we will never die? Just as the Israelites pass through the waters of the Red Sea to safety on the other side, all by the word and power of God, we too have been brought through the waters of our baptism by the word and power of God that actually brings faith, the forgiveness of sins, and life everlasting. When serpents invaded the Israelite camp, biting and killing people, God had Moses raise a bronze serpent on a pole and have people look at it. Those who looked at it and believed were saved, and this foreshadowed the raising up of Christ on the cross of Calvary to be sacrificed for the sin of the world. Those who now look to Christ by faith and believe in His power to save now have everlasting life. The prophet's promise brings God's promise of of His Messiah time and time again. And Isaiah reveals that the Messiah will be a suffering servant who is smitten and afflicted by God. But he will not raise his voice in protest. God would make his grave with the wicked and his cursed, with his cursed death on the cross and he would be laid in the tomb of a rich man. The Messiah is sent to bear our sins and by his wounds we are healed. And we will recognize this Messiah because he will be the one who brings good news to the poor. He is the one who will bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives. He is the one who will open the prison to all those who are bound by their sin. He is the one who will proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, and comfort. Comfort all who mourn. He is the one who will give us a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. All of this points to Jesus. Psalm 22, 31, and 69 are spoken by Jesus at his crucifixion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Into your hand I commit my spirit. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched for my thirst. They gave me sour wine to drink. And there, there is so much more. All of Holy Scripture points to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So if your heart is troubled today, put yourself in a position to read or hear God's word so that you might grow in your understanding of God's promises for you. Do not reject the work of the Holy Spirit to bring you faith and understanding. For God will use his word to create, sustain, and build your faith while making you a witness to the ends of the earth that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord of all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now the peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our weekly awakening question for this week is quite simple, and I've already answered it, but you can add to it if you'd like. 
How does Jesus work understanding in you? How does Jesus work understanding in you? Blessings on your week.